to um, to be here and to have the honor of introducing Jill. Um, Joanne and I met in our graduate program almost 20 years ago. Can I say that? <laughs> and um, Jill was instrumental as a source of support and just great friendship as we made our way through our graduate studies. So I'm thrilled to be here um, to introduce her. So I'll move on to the formal introduction. So Joanna Johnson is the Director of Writing in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Miami, for which she directs the undergraduate academic writing curriculum, as well as providing grant and other writing support for faculty, postdoctoral fellows, and graduate students in all disciplines university-wide. Joanna has been involved with the UM Writing Program, which includes writing centers at all three UM campuses for 18 years, composing inquiry methods and readings for investigation and writing. Um, oh, sorry. She's contributed to writing texts, including composing inquiry methods and readings for investigation and writing, and published articles in edited collections on spatial approaches to literature writing and geography. Her publication and research interests also include rhetoric and health, scientific and engineering communication, and writing in other STEM disciplines. She regularly contributes to the responsible conduct of research training for graduates and postdoctoral fellows at UM, and was recently the recipient of an Association of American Medical Colleges Award for her work on the role of writing in scientific reproducibility. Join me in welcoming Joanne. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew. Um, so it's lovely to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have a couple of thank yous um, before we before we get going. Um, certainly to all of you for coming. I think it's really wonderful that you've turned out tonight, and I'm I'm very appreciative. Um, I have a couple of, of particular thank yous. People in here who've who've um, really shaped this project in a few ways. I mean, I don't have time to talk about that at any great length, but I want to single out in particular Danielle Hauk, um, Adina Sanchez Garcia, and Ken Goodman, all of whom have. Um, spent a good deal of time with me working through some of the ideas that you are going to see and hear um, before you tonight. Um, <clears throat> I also want to spend a bit of time or um, just also acknowledging um, my brother, Matthew Johnson. Uh, Matthew Johnson is um, an archaeologist and he has a lot of ideas about <laughs> landscape theory. Um, and much of what he has um, been researching was sort of germane to some of the ideas that I have here too. So I wanted to acknowledge his contributions to what I'm talking about as well. <clears throat> so it's all very complicated. <laughs> all right, there we go. Um, so uh, topographies of Caribbean writing race in the British countryside, what, what's it all about? Well, one of the, the, the basic premise or the underlying um, thought that, that we might have when we're thinking about what the British countryside is, is kind of under, underpinning the ways in which I was thinking about um, Caribbean writing and how it contributed to the, um, the impressions and the perspectives that we have of the British countryside. Um, I think the British countryside, especially the English countryside, has a particular kind of place in um, the way in which we view the nation. Um, so, for example, um, you know, it's a very, if, you know, if, if, if you think, if you want to sort of imagine um, what the British countryside or the English countryside especially looks like, you might think of sort of, I don't know, but rolling hills or hedgerows. Um, you might think of people playing cricket. You might think of um, some shepherds, you know, these and cattle and herds and those kinds of things. And that, and that sort of essential quality of what the British and the English countryside is like is a very particular constructed ideology. Um, and and th my book spends a lot of time thinking about why that's the case um, and how that has come to be. And in particular, um, certainly the Romantic period, um, I think, played a great part in constructing how we see the British countryside today. 
Um, so that kind of that attention to the aesthetic, um, thinking about the, the self, those kinds of things have really sort of played, um, mm -hmm. begun to set up um, continued a, a narrative, if you like, of a binary of the city versus the country um, and where the city or, or things in the city are seen as, if you like, this kind of fall, especially over um, after the Industrial, Re Industrial Revolution. Um, everything in the, in, the, in the countryside was supposed to be this wonderful, organic, pure place. Um, the Industrial Revolution in many ways, although obviously was very progressive in, 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 in many ways, um, was also seen as this kind of fall. And, and Britain's English, England's countryside is seen as very much this kind of organic, supposedly um, unsullied, very pure space. Um, but but it, it really isn't. It's very constructed. Um, and we're going to have a look at a few things tonight um, of, of where I'm going to show you that. And in particular, the perspective that I have, of course, here is to do with the ways in which Caribbean writing um, and Caribbean writers have shaped that countryside or been shaped by the countryside. So it's a, it's a, a trajectory that goes both ways. Caribbean, the Caribbean writers that we're looking at um, are Anglo-Caribbean writers, so they grew up in, in, in islands. Many of you in here I know know a great deal about Caribbean history. Um, many of the islands changed hands several times. Um, Barbados was the only one that was only ever only British, um, and of course now it's independent. Um, but many of them changed hands several times. But in any case, all of the writers that I'm looking at are, if you like, a kind of Anglo, Anglo-Caribbean. Um, so Jean Rees from Dominica, uh, Derek uh, V.S. Knight Paul from Trinidad, Derek Walcott from St. Lucia, um, Grace Nichols from Guyana, um, and some more contemporary British um, Caribbean writers, Anglo Caribbean, Caribbean writers as well. Um, so when those people grew up and when they had their education, it was a very colonial education, and they would have learned the um, literature from their. Um, what, what was called the, the, actually, Tim, you can probably help with the Nelson's West Indian Reader, I think it was called, <laughs> something like that. Um, and so everybody learned from this sort of this anthology of literature. So everybody would have been learning the same kinds of things, and it would have invo involved, not least, lots and lots of daffodils, right? So the words were thrown about <laughs> daffodils. Um, so I wanted to start with this particular quote from Derek Walcott. Derek Walcott um, was Nobel Laureate, I think in 1990, I think he received that. So from St. Lucia, from the island of St. Lucia. Um, and Derek Walcott, as we'll see, has a particular kind of interest in the formality of English poetry, especially. Um, press one foot on the soil of England and the Phantom Spring. Poets, naturalists, novelists have harrowed and hallowed it for centuries with their furrowing pens, as steadily as its yeoman once did with the plough. No other literature is so botanical as English, so seeded with delight and melancholy in the seasons. Um, and that really sets up a really wonderful um, view that especially Walcott has, or certainly I think, I hope it gives you just a little taste of the way in which literature and, and the countryside or the country in England are really kind of, you know, they're, they're very meshed um, and they're, 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 it's, you know, it's a very rich, it's a very rich landscape. My next uh, slide is very brief. I wanted to um, signal to you a couple of things to go back to what I had said earlier about Britain's countryside being this kind of, if you like, almost an aggregate of, of certain romantic kinds of images. Um, Salisbury Cathedral, this picture on the left here, I don't know if it's particularly this one, but um, one of the things that was really nice about this talk was that I was able to put pictures in. You see, in my book, I couldn't do any pictures because those of you who, who have done books and have tried to put pictures in one, though that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, so I can show you the pictures now. Um, so Salisbury Cathedral, this was voted the most beautiful, wonderful, uh, whatever it was, and some, some um, ex uh, you know, exemplar of, of British, of English beauty. Um, I think it was the most, most loved view in Britain. Um, and I've given you a picture too of John Constable, obviously the, the romantic painter. Um, and, and his impression of it too. So again, this is to show you um, really the ways in which that this this particular view of England, this particular very romantic, you know, that literary period, that romantic period, has really shaped a lot of what we value, what people value in, in the English countryside. 
again another couple of um, slides that I think are, are interesting perhaps for you to, to get a sense of what I'm trying to, to set up a little bit um, in terms of the way that we see the countryside versus the city and we'll come on to that in just a moment. This is actually the back cover, I'm, I'm, these, are, these are spoilers, I'm giving away the back cover before I've shown you the front cover. Um, this is actually the back cover of an English heritage, or that, yes an English heritage, brochure called Power of Place um, and on the back cover is this particular picture. And this picture is, is obviously of a you know, very typical English village, if you like. I mean, I mentioned earlier, this is your, your typical, um, what one would understand to be a typical English village, you know, the, the, the chocolate box houses. I don't know if there's a sheep up there in the, in the front there, but they could be, right? Um, the, the, the church, the village life going on around the village green. And this is contrasted... Um, in this particular brochure, and again, this is relevant to some of the things that I'm trying to, to um, think about tonight with you, uh, with the way in which the countryside is seen as, as oppositional to, or in, in contrast to, or in, in opposition to um, the urban environment. So this is the front cover of that particular brochure, um, The Power of Place, The Future of the Historical Environment. Uh, this is, does anybody know where this is? Anybody been to London? This is Brixton Market. It's Brixton Market and it's Electric Avenue. Um, so they've picked that. It's a very particular place that they've picked. Um, it's Brixton was um, historically, still is, it's a very diverse neighbourhood, but all, all most neighbourhoods are in Britain, in, in London certainly now. Um, but particularly it's where a lot of West Indian immigration was. So they've picked a particular place that, had, that connotes um, certain kinds of ideas about what they're trying to say about the, the urban environment um, of the picture that they've taken there. So then I want you to think back to the to the last slide, right, and how you contrast these two, right, the, the, the opposites. So the Caribbean authors or the Caribbean writers that, that we're looking at tonight, um, will have grown up in a very colonial, uh, with a very colonial education. So they grew up in various different islands um, in the Caribbean. And I'm showing you this slide because this is a very particular, and this quote, which I think is very interesting in terms of thinking about the ways in which the countryside versus, so I've already talked a little bit about the way the countryside in Britain is seen as this very inclusive space. It's and both inclusive and exclusive, that sounds contradictory. But it's a very exclusive space in that it's very English, right? But it's um, it's it's kind of included and in, in excludes other people, right? So it's not a particularly diverse place. Um, Stuart Hall's Jamaican sociologist, um, he, um, but then he says, or he said, um, he's, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, um, but he said, if you come from the sticks, this is what he wrote about, if you come from the sticks, the colonial sticks, you want to live on Eros Statue in Piccadilly Circus. You don't want to go and live in, in somewhere, someone else's metropolitan sticks, right? You want to go and live right in the centre of, of, of the world, right? Um, and the centre of the world for, for most people in the Caribbean at that time was the motherland, was Eros Statue in the centre of Piccadilly Circus. Um, so again, thinking about the countryside of Britain, thinking about England's countryside, thinking about what the, the opposition is to the rural, I'm sorry, to the, to the, to the urban, and the ways in which Caribbean, Stuart Hall highlights the ways in which Caribbean people wouldn't necessarily have wanted to go to the countryside because it would have seen been seen as this kind of the sticks. Um, and of course, the, a lot of the work was in the urban areas um, and much of the writing that was done and much of the, um, certainly the fiction was written about urban environments. Um, you know, there's lots of, of um, immigrant narratives about the experience of being in the urban environment, but far fewer of how they treat the, this more exclusive British countryside space. Let's have a look now then at a little bit more at that, that very famous poem. Um, when I was looking for, um, for the slides for, for this talk, um, you know, it says it's the most famous poem in the English language. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the tr true, but I think one of, perhaps why I should have put one of the most famous poems. Um, but certainly, and again, those of you um, here tonight who work in Caribbean studies will know that most Caribbean authors have at some, at some time talked about 
this um, the trope of the daffodil, right? It's a very it's a very big trope in in colonial um, studies because the ways of the ways in which these these writers who had this education and were taught about this poem and they had to learn to recite it, you know, ad nauseam. Um, it really became quite traumatic, traumatic for several of them. After, I mean, Jamaica Kincaid, for example. I don't don't work with her in this book, but you know, she she has these nightmares of daffodils chasing her down the street. And, um, it, you know, and it and it's very difficult for for authors to these writers to understand what the daffodil is all about because it was part of their education, but they really didn't understand it. They'd never seen it, and they all have very very different um, reactions to it. They all have very different. Um, feelings about it and, and we might come back to one or two of them as, as we go along um, but you can see here again then Stuart Hall again Jamaican um, he what he says about them is that you know when he first got here um, I really like this quote I think it's it's great you know he looked out and he couldn't he 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 saw words with daffodils right it became real for him um, Derek Walcott talks about this as well how reading about things becomes real for him um, as he sees them of course, what, would, what else would you expect to find? That's what I knew about. That's what trees and flowers meant. I didn't know the names of the flowers I've just left behind in Jamaica. And I don't, I'm sure that's not, I'm sure he's not lying. I'm sure he didn't know the names of the trees and the flowers he'd left behind in Jamaica. You know, he knew much more about the flowers, the daffodils of Wordsworth poem than he did about his, his, the country he had grown up in. This is a, this is a slide. Um, it wasn't just so. It wasn't just. We talked a little bit about the daffodils, or I've mentioned mentioned them and the kind of the the, um, the significance they had on people um, whose education was in was a very colonial British education. Um, there's also another really big connection that's relevant to to the work that I've been doing, and of course that's the way in which um, landscape, the way in which countryside um, and physicality is kind of imposed. Um, on the different landscapes. So this landscape here, division and boundary denote ownership and hierarchy. Um, it's not a particularly good, it's not a particularly good resolution, so you can't see terribly well. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't take too much imagination to think that this was this could be in England, right? I mean, it looks quite similar to the, to the slide we saw earlier. Um, and in fact, I've put it next to, next to that one that we saw before, um, juxtaposed it here. In fact, the one on the left is um, taken in Barbados, and it's actually a plantation. Um, so you can see the ways in which there's still the rolling hills, there's this kind of, you know, the, the, the rolling, um, uh, the hedgerows, um, the ways in which the roads are, are constructed. Um, and so it wasn't just an imposition of, of the sort of the colonial education, it was also an imposition of the physicality of Britain's countryside onto um, the colonial landscape as well. And that's really important to remember too. So these people, these writers that we're looking at, have got this this very particular kind of view of what Britain's countryside is like and a particular value that the, the, the literature is, is, is particularly rich for them or particularly significant. So the next few... Um, Slides that I'm going to talk about are then um, they they relate to the to the next chapters in in the book, um, and I've treated it um, chronologically, um, and um, so I'm just going to pull a few things about what each to what I've dealt with in each chapter. Hopefully, it's just a few sort of little nuggets to give you a taste of, of what I've been talking about and how it relates to the overall picture of, of what I've already described. So, Jean Rees then. Jean Rees is from Dominica. Um, she was born in 1890, um, and of course, she her most famous work is Wide Sack SOC. Um, that came it came out very very late in her her career, if you can be called a career. She spent a she spent a very long time in Britain. She moved to Britain in, in um, 1907, I believe, when she was 16, and um, and she spent a little bit of time in France. She spent some time in in, in Holland. Um, but for the most part, she was she was living in Britain and she was living in, in the countryside and she was living in great poverty. 
Um, Jean Reese was a very interesting woman. Um, she has all, all kind. There's all kinds of stories I could I could regale you with about Jean Reese. Um, but she, in particular, I think she occupies a very interesting place in the in the literary canon because she doesn't really occupy a place in the literary canon. She doesn't really fit into any any place at all. Um, so here is a nice quote I think that that helps you understand who she was. Representations of British countryside are a key tool in Reese's negotiated responses to a country where she found herself marginalised. She found herself marginalised both as a woman and as a, quote, horrid colonial. So when she was growing up, um, she considered herself or she was considered to be white, white Creole. Um, and so in Dominica, she was it, certainly different to much of the population. Um, and when she came to Britain, she was also then considered to be different to much of the population. So um, wherever she went, and especially, I think, um, once she was in Britain, she, again, she didn't really have very much money at all. So she really bit, was, was very marginalised in all kinds of ways. Um, her first champion was Ford Maddox Ford. So this is another, another piece of Jean Rees. Um, she went, she was sort of part of, but marginal to, the, the left bank set. Um, but Ford Maddox Ford championed her, her first work and, and her first short stories were, were published in, um, in the left bank um, by Ford Maddox Ford. So she was, she was taken up by him. Um, and um, anyway, then she then she went to, to Britain and she spent a long time in Britain. Um, again, you know, in the countryside, going around different places. She went to the um, she was going she went to the coast. She went to all these boarding houses. She was a chorus girl for a while. Um, she lived in Norfolk and um, in the wilds of Norfolk. And let me tell you, having lived in the wilds of Norfolk, I have every sympathy for her. Um, and um, you know, she she got arrested a few times. She was drunk and disorderly. Um, Again, if you've lived in the wilds of Norfolk, you might you might uh, <laughs> sympathise about that. Um, but in any case, um, Jean Rees had a couple of... So remember the, the, the daffodils we talked about? So Jean Rees was one of those people that had that sort of visceral reaction to the daffodils. Um, and one of the things that she writes about in, her, in one of her short stories, The Day, the Day They Burned the Books... Um, she meets an English boy. So an English boy comes to the island and it's an, it's a, it's an unnamed, but it's a Caribbean island. Um, and the boy um, is English and everybody's sort of flocking around the boy because they think he's interesting. He's got these stories to tell and, and he's very dismissive and he says, oh, you know, I'm not interested in, um, in England. It's, it's not as good as you think it is. And, um, and, she, and she says in the story, this, this girl narrator, you know, um, I, I, was, I was in awe of him. Um, I too was, was tired of learning to recite poems about, about daffodils, right? That was, that was tiring to me too. Um, so she had this reaction, certainly these, this reaction to, to daffodils. But one of the things that, that Jean Rees did have, um, much has been written about Jean Rees, um, and, and we certainly don't have, have time to go into that t tonight, but my angle on it in this book is really about the way in which she she approached the physical um, surround of who she was, of, 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 of the countryside around her to kind of negotiate these very difficult surroundings. Um, she's a very modernist style writer. You know, it's very brief. There's a lot of brevity and, and she um, uh, doesn't, I mean, for example, Ford Maddox Ford talks about the way in which she doesn't really sort of deal with, with um, emotions or she doesn't deal with with surrounds or context and those kinds of things she doesn't build the atmosphere in that sense but but what she does do and this is what i argue is she uses this the, the kind of physicality of her surrounding to sort of negotiate this response where she felt very marginalized um so she would hark back to the flowers back in dominica she would think about um she's lying in a in a um in a bath in a boarding house and the, the landlady is all is all mad at her because she's used up all the hot water. Um, one doesn't do that in Britain. Um, and um, yeah, so she was very cross with her. And uh, and and Jean Reese lies back and she's and she puts her toe in the tap and she's thinking about the water coming down. She's thinking about the waterfall in Dominica. So these things sort of help her sort of negotiate these very difficult places. Um, and the title of the the chapter in my book is is from the rock. Um, uh, remembrance rocks and she has this 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 thing up on her her wall about the way in which she doesn't forget about the rock from which she was she was hewn and I think that's really important in thinking about who she is um, and how she negotiates this very difficult place um, that that she's in um, I've got just got one small piece I want to read um, to you 
Um, and this is um, this is actually from an unpublished manuscript um, where Jean Rees talks about um, the way in which she begins to really find peace and solace in Britain. This is a place, remember, that she's, she's felt very alienated, but she begins to find peace and solace. And she says, um, I think the first time this, she's going for a walk. She says, I think the first time this beauty knocked me flat was round cowslip field day. I had been smelling this very delicious scent for some time and I walked on without knowing what it was. Then I came on a huge field of, ca field of cowslips. The scent was so sweet, so strong, you simply can't imagine it. I stayed for a long time, unable to leave the place. It was after this I fell in love with the Gower Peninsula. Um, and then she talks about, um, for the first time, she says, I began to believe England had been beautiful in parts. Now, I know the Gower Peninsula is not England, it's in Wales, um, but clearly Jean Rees didn't know that. Um, but in any case, that I re I'm reading that to you because I think it's a really good example of the way in which she, she takes the physicality and she begins to find England beautiful because of, of the heat and the, and, and the colour. You know, you think about the colour, the, the yellow, right? Um, so her final declaration that it's only now, um, for the first time she finds so-called England to be beautiful, is a further indication of the extent to which Reese has found this confidence and this ability to admire the countryside of which she's previously been wary. Um, and she's found that confidence through, through the landscape. So then, oh, the next author, um, the next writer, uh, the next chapter in my book is, is about V.S. Naipaul. Um, V.S. Naipaul <laughs> is very, is, is, I don't even know where to begin with V.S. Naipaul. Many people say he's more English than the English. Um, I don't know <laughs> quite, quite what that means, but, um, you know, that when I was, when I was researching this book, there really isn't very much, um, you know, I mentioned about the urban experience, and of course, typically, because that's where the work was, that's where Caribbean people typically went to, because they had to, they had to get work when they came, and they were, they were recruited to come to Britain to, to get to, to do the work. Um, and so, a lot of, you don't really find very much um, information about the right, there's not very much writing about the British countryside. So the first, the first challenge I had in this was actually finding things to, to um, uh, Caribbean writers had actually written about the countryside, but V.S. Michael was a major exception. Um, and it, The Enigma of Arrival, which is a, I mean, it's not even semi-autobiographical, it's autobiographical. I mean, you know, he talks about I, but it is a sort of a kind of fictitious account. Um, and in the, in the Enigma of Arrival, he talks about um, arriving in Britain. He comes to Britain from Trinidad um, to take up a scholarship at Oxford and um, he um, has a number of, again, a number of challenges. He lives in London for a while, but he moves out to the Wiltshire. He moves out to Wiltshire to, to um, near the Salisbury Plain, near the, the photograph I showed you, um, to heal what he calls heal. So, um, again, the quote here I, I hope can give, give some illustration, right? Um, so, while he may perceive solace and healing in the Wiltshire Downs in which he makes his home, some of that peace, I, I say, in fact comes from associations he makes with images and memories of his childhood in Trinidad. Um, so very briefly, I know we have to move on, I want to um, uh, just talk to you about very briefly what he, he finds these condensed milk tins, right? So, so in, the, in the islands, he, he had these condensed milk tins and they had these black and white cows on them. And he kept thinking of like Gray's herd and, and he was thinking about the ways in which these cows evoked um, this literature that he had read when he was, he was a child. And so again, Knight Paul is somebody who pulls on these sort of these these views of landscape and what he imagines the landscape to be from his childhood. Likewise, he has these allotments when he's a child, um, and they remind when he sees. I'm sorry, he has um, he grows seeds when he's a child, and he sees allotments when he's in Britain when he's older, and these seeds remind him of growing um, growing things. So, although he claims that he's thinking about the British landscape in a particular kind of a way, um, I, I say that a lot of that solace, in fact, um, comes from the ways in which he sees his background too. Uh, Derek Walcott, we touched on earlier. Um, I, I included him, and I think he's interesting for us to, to just consider for a couple of minutes, um, because his engagement with with the English countryside is, is I would say, is very formal. It's a very formal engagement in terms of poetical formality. Um, he's somebody who doesn't, 
at least from the way he writes about Britain, he doesn't seem especially enamoured with it. He talks about, you'll forgive me, he talks about the rain pissing down in Britain as opposed to in, in Wales where it gently prods. You know? <laughs> so, you know, he's not one to, to mince his words. And by, by the way, um, people, everybody in this book, I've, I've been slowly killing them off because everyone in this book is has died since I wrote the book. And so the next people coming really need to watch their backs because hopefully um, it, it's not going to be them next. Anyway, um, Walcott, um, yeah, just, just briefly, I think, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail with Walcott. Obviously, he's, you know, his body of work is so huge. and But there's one or two pieces of what he writes about in the way in which he writes about the English countryside that I think is really interesting, juxtaposed with the way in which he writes about the Welsh countryside. So, you know, I gave you it. I mean, he literally does say that the rain is pissing down in, in England um, and he crosses the border. He's in Wales and the, the rain is gently prodding and he crosses the border and it's sort of like sheeting down on the window and he's like sitting on these, these red vinyl calf seats and, you know, and, he, and he, you, can, you can feel this kind of rejection of, of everything that's, that's English. Um, but what he does do, and he absolutely remember from the quote that you saw earlier about the ways in which he um, he says that the, the literature is so seeded with melancholy and it's just so rich and beautiful. You know, Walcott is always going to um, take a lot of, um, he's, he's going to get a lot from what the, the history of the literature is for him. And I think that that, it, it, that supersedes anything else, the way in which he sees about the, the, the countryside, it's when he actually sees the countryside itself. Um, so I've just got another couple of slides um, or a couple of authors that I want to talk to you about and then, then uh, I can wrap up um, so um, Grace Nichols Grace Nichols is from, from Guyana she, um, she moved to Britain I think when she was about 17 or so um, and Grace Nichols is um, very interesting poet um, in that she her her work I and mean, she's she's published several volumes, but it's really taken a sort of a turn. And what I argue in this book, um, much of her early work is about. Um, there's been a lot of feminist critique of it. There's a lot of work about how she uses the body to to express how she feels. Um, there's a lot, you know, she 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 negotiates her space, um, in, and she talks a lot about physicality. Um, there was a poem, though, called Hurricane Hits England. Um, we, we did have a hurricane in England in, in 1987, um, and it's become, it's become infamous. I'm not sure we've had one before or since, but we did have one, and, um, uh, and it took us all very much by surprise. Um, and Grace Nichols wrote a poem about it, Hurricane Hits England, and, she, and it's almost like a turning point for her in, in her work. Prior to that, she's talking about negotiating... Um, her space, feeling very marginalised, trying to make find her place in London, um, feeling very alienated. And then um, she writes this poem. She has this hurricane, there's a hurricane hits England. Um, and all of a sudden she says, oh, this was, you know, it made me feel at home. It was, it was difficult, but it made me feel like, like I was home again, this, this hurricane. So, um, and, and after that, a lot of her poetry shifted. She started, started to talk a lot more about landscape. Um, in particular, her, one of her more recent collections, Picasso, I Want My Face Back, the first part of it is about um, the, Picasso's muse, Dora Maar, um, but also a lot of it is about the place in which she lives, and she now lives in the British countryside, she lives in Sussex, um, she also lived for a while or had, did some tenure in, in Hull, Kingston upon Hull in the northeast of England. And um, she writes about going on trains and she writes about um, the ways. And so, for example, she evokes Larkins, right, you know, to review from the train window. And she, she talks about how this train is like a snake. And she uses the, the literature, the language um, to evoke these kinds of these thoughts again from, from her childhood. So it's almost like that, that poem was a kind of a pivotal moment for her to renegotiate where she's living. And she talks more about Seven Sisters, for example, these, these white cliff type um, edifices and where she lives on the Sussex Downs. Um, so Grace Nichols is, um, she's, she plays a very important um, role, I think, in certainly in the chronology of the authors that I'm dealing with here. And remember, you know, Jean Rees from the turn of the last century um, through um, V.S. Nye Paul and, and Derek Walcott. I, I don't know if I want to call them old school necessarily, but I suppose that's one way of describing it. But 
but but Grace Nichols really sort of she, she makes she makes the shift. Grace Nichols has kind of come from from um, that background too, certainly. But she's 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 produced so much work since she's lived in Britain, um, and it's now and now has really quite a different a feel to it. Um, I don't want to talk too much longer because there's a couple of more things I want to say. I had got a couple of things I wanted to read you from about Grace Nichols, but I want to want to move on so we get on to the next. So these three authors um, are authors who, this is really quite a different sort of movement, if you like. It's, it's, um, these three author, authors were all born, actually they weren't all born in, does anybody know? They weren't all born in Britain. Carol Phillips was born in, in St. Kitts, but he came to Britain, went to Britain, where are we? He went to Britain um, in, when he was four months old. So I think we can count him as being, as being British. So these three authors... Um, and, and Andrea Levy died very recently, um, uh, very young, so that was that was very tragic. Um, but she um, she wrote um, a book, particularly that I deal with in this, called *The Fruit of the Lemon*. Um, and um, in it, she talks about she, this is her quote: "Black people and countryside don't go together in white people's thinking." And what she does is she talks about the ways in which um, when you go somewhere and you, so for example, if you go to sort of an English country pub um, and you're not white or you're not of that area, you feel, you, you really don't feel like you fit in. Um, and she, she writes a lot about that and her characters struggle with, with that kind of fitting in, um, feeling as though they, they, they don't fit in. Um, I've got a couple of things I'd like to read to you. Um, So this is from Fruit, Fruit of the Lemon. Um, and so this is Andrea Levy, and she has, and the protagonist in it is called Faith, and Faith is, is of Jamaican descent. Um, and she says, occasionally we used to stop to get out of the van with the aim of running through a field. She, so she lives in London. She's, she's traveling to the countryside. With the aim of running through a field or paddling in a river. But we were always greeted with fences and gates and barbed wire. And we never knew how to actually get onto that green and pleasant land. Remember, green and pleasant land is the line from William Blake's, you know, from Jerusalem. So that, again, sets up a very a classic image of, of, the, of, of the English countryside. Um, The, the, these feelings of, um, and this is again, I'm, re I'm reading here from the book. Um, the feelings of, of the alienation and, and um, suggest they can be. I think they can be explained in part by the incongruity between the nostalgic um, and national images of the of the rural community as these sort of friendly, peaceful, and caring um, sort of places with the lived reality that Levy describes of actually feeling very alienated. Um, so there's this sort of paradoxical relationship between the idealised and national images associated with this harmonious construction, sorry, constitution of the rural community, middle class hegemony, gendered identities and processes of exclusion. Um, so where distinctively middle class ideals about the neighbourly, friendly, caring constitution of the village community um, become entwined with the reproduction of this white cultural hegemony. Um, and I think you see that in Andrew Levy's texts, I think you see it too in Carol Phillips' texts. Um, you know, he writes about an English an English village where the 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 people feel very alienated because of, it's supposed to be a place you go to heal. Remember, V. S. Night Paul said he wanted to go to heal to a, an English village to heal this solid this this healing, but in fact, it's really quite you know people people make you feel very alienated. Um, and so these three three authors find this, or at least the first two authors, I think, and you can find instances in their text where they where they um, where they have that experience. Um, Charlotte Williams is a bit different, um, and again, I'm just going to spend just a little um, little bit of time on Charlotte Williams. She's um, particularly, um, her background is, is both Welsh and, and Guyanese. Um, and and in, interestingly, she, she feels very much sort of attached to, I mean, her mother spoke Welsh. I mean, she was Welsh Welsh. And so she feels that Welsh is very much a part of her identity too. And interestingly, she really negotiates the landscape very differently, I think. She sees it as very, she talks about it not being a countryside, but instead 
a landscape. She talks about, um, this is very much a landscape, dramatic and magical, rather than merely countryside, Williams writes. I could never tire of those visions of Wales. I wanted to be part of that landscape, to be in view. Um, so Williams' understanding here is that she wants to be a part of the landscape, much like Naipaul does when he writes in Enigma of Arrival. Um, and when she gets back from, she goes, she travels around Africa and Guyana, and when she gets back, she really sees, she sees that that um, experience, that experience has shaped her much um, in particular ways, and she feels that those colours seem sharper, um, and especially, and I think this is, this is great, um, there are, she talks about the slate and the, the, the greys of the rock in, in, in Wales, and she talks about them in such magical ways, um, the ways in which they were, um, different different colours, even these very black, these black and white, these grey things, she talks about them in different colours. Um, there are a couple of um, slides I want to show you as well um, that I think are, that hopefully will illustrate um, some of what I've been talking about. This is a photographer, again, this is something I would have loved to have actually put in the book because I think it's so great, um, but I don't know where Ingrid Pollard is, but she didn't reply to me. So, um, but this is a obviously it's a sort of it's a mock up of a of a postcard, right? Um, and Wordsworth Country is the Lake District, you know, English countryside. And she says the image takes the form of a mass produced tourist postcard. It shows the profile of William Wordsworth, nineteenth century English poet laureate. Wordsworth and his poetry are icons closely linked with the Lake District. Um, and then she's you know this group of contemporary. <laughs> black uh, walkers who are trying to sort of navigate this landscape. They, they look a bit fed up, don't they, really? <laughs> I don't think they really like they're having a great time. Um, maybe it's just cold and bleak. But, you know, that sort of image that, as I say, that chocolate box image of what you think of the English countryside, it's not, you don't really see it too, too well here. And, uh, and this is another of, of uh, Ingrid Pollard's. Um, pieces as well, which is which is great. And I, I Andrea Levy, um, one of the authors that I mentioned earlier, talks about remember she talked about not being able to get onto the space there was fences and barbed wires and here is a is a, a photographic representation of that you know she's sitting she literally you know she can't get onto the she can't get onto the space um it's as if the black experience is only lived within an urban environment i thought i liked the lake district where i wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white um, a visit to the countryside is always accompanied by a feeling of unease dread um so again that that you know, that echoes a lot of what Andrea, Andrea Levy was saying. Um, but then remember to um, what Charlotte Williams said about how she felt about, about Wales. Um, I, I think I probably am just about done, but there's a couple of other things that I want to just finish up with and read you a very small piece from the end of my, from the end of my um, book. Um, so the final chapter, the concluding chapter, is about imagine. It's called imaginative geographies, which is not my term. That's Homi Baba's term. Um, but the the British landscape. I mean, this is the, these are my words. Um, the British landscape of these writers now now changes like a like a kaleidoscope. And I think that that's where the trajectory I have seen of these authors um, takes us to. So they 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 write the landscape in the first instance with a kind of scepticism and a worry about what it what it is and what it represents and what its significance is to them because of this very difficult and and and, and freighted background. Um, but as the the authors, um, the more contemporary authors, they they have much more of an of an ability or a nuance to be able to understand the landscape in more nuanced ways. Um, so I'd like to read you just a, a small piece here. I'm just going to have some water. So this is the conclusion. As she crossed the Atlantic in 1907, sailing away from her Dominican home for the first time to England, Jean Rhys quickly forget, be, found it began to grow cold and that the sky was grey, not blue. This view of Britain began a journey charted extensively in these pages. The transatlantic migration ends somewhat differently, however, for Charlotte Williams, who instead celebrates the life of the place in the thin and cool air of Wales, and where even the greys were not simply grey, but cast in infinite, sto infinite variations, stone, pebble, pebble, 
mercury, pewter, chrome, dust, steel. The writers we've seen here tonight have used the British countryside to negotiate their varying attachment to Britain, including questions of heritage and marginalisation, and they've shown different degrees of the extent of the affiliation to their various heritages, both real and imagined, and from the Caribbean and Britain. All these writers are still furrowing the British soil with their pens, remember that's what Walcott said, albeit in quite different ways to their poetical forebears that Walcott alludes to. But what is more strikingly different is that they no longer expect to see words with daffodils when they view Britain. Rather, they look out, they respond to, and they create a new way of seeing the British countryside. Now there is a more detailed understanding in a more nuanced and complex way in these writers' accounts than we saw before, one where the British landscape now changes like a kaleidoscope. The imaginative geographies of these writers' Britain are ones that increasingly allow for their different voices. No longer do these writers reflect a unison view of, on Britain's countryside. Rather, they create their own view, a way of seeing the landscape that is new and different and multifaceted and all the richer for it. Um, and I'm going to fi finish then um, with a couple of slides that are of particular interest to me because I think it does show some progression in the way in which we view the countryside today in Britain. Remember, it's, you know, it's a very exclusive space. Lots of people feel very unwelcome. Um, this is um, from the National Trust site. No, I'm sorry. It's, yes, it is the National Trust site, I think. So this is Penryn Castle. Um, this is just a screenshot of um, a castle, in fact, that Charlotte Williams talks about in her, um, in her text. Her book is called Sugar and Slate, and she, and of course that refers to um, the, the sugar, the plantation, and the slavery that's part of her background, and also the slate, the mining, which is part of the North Wales, Wales um, background. So Penryn Castle was owned by somebody called Richard Pennant. Um, it's this so-called, you know, you see here it says 19th century fantasy castle um, with spectacular surroundings. Um, and, um, and Richard Pennant was an, was an anti-abolitionist. Um, and, you know, and of course, so a lot of the money that, that this was built from, um, you know, it has a, it has a particular, it, it, it was originally, when I was first doing this research, it was presented solely as this very sort of, you know, one dimensional, if you like, it was this fantasy castle. They had lots of things on the web pages about it being Downton Abbey-esque, whatever it was, right? You know, it's all sort of, um, it was just very, very sanitized. Um, but they've actually, uh, you know, I did, did had to dig a little, but still there is now a page about Penryn Castle and the, the transatlantic slave trade. So we, we have made some progress. They are actually acknowledging that there is this history behind the building of Penryn Castle um, and that that actually is a very, very um, real piece of its history and, and part of what it is today and what, how, it, how it's made today and what it represents today. Um, so... The things that I have looked at in this book, um, then, or the ways in which the writers have thought about the countryside, are, I think play into what we're beginning to see a little bit more of a shift towards today. Um, the ways in which these authors, um, their views are no longer sort of reflective of a countryside that they were told was that they should revere um, and instead they're going back and they're sort of remaking and they're rewriting the countryside for themselves. Thank you. I'm happy to take picture, um, pictures. I'm happy, to take pictures. I'm happy also to take questions. <laughs> Yeah, selfie, right? <laughs> yes, Meg. I'm embarrassed to ask that I didn't catch on to this earlier because I have a bad habit of conflating British and English. Um, no, everybody does. <laughs> no, I, I speak a lot about that. Well, thank you. Um, so, if I'm Just don't it, ask me to explain Brexit. I won't, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm understanding correctly, um, when you talk about British countryside, you're not necessarily just talking about English. Yeah, and you know, and I know, and I was aware when I was talking, I was kind of like just slipping between the two. Of course, yeah, there's a construct between the. I mean, they they, they represent different things, and Britain obviously is different to England, and right. Um, so, for example, um, Jean um, Reese. Reese, thank mm -hmm. you. She at some point is thinking back to uh, Dominica, mm -hmm. and and maybe other writers too. 
loan to a British landscape and how that's a part of their negotiation as well? Is that... That's right. But yeah, absolutely. But I mean, again, you know, you think about the, the daffodils, you know, they're thinking they, they, they're learning all these poems and they're, they're reading about things all the time. I mean, V.S. and I, Paul as well, has this in, in his West Indian reader. He has this picture of Ophelia drowning in the rushes. And so when he goes to um, to the Wiltshire Downs, he he sees a, a, a stream and he imagines Ophelia in it. So much of what is constructed in when they have when they're in in their their places of their birth is comes from literature and it comes from images from literature as well so i mean i don't know the extent to which i I mean i I really don't know i don't know the extent to which they would have real images of what it was like but there's there's an impression of course i mean this this is this is the mother country right this is where one you don't go when you go to the mother country you want to go to the center of it right and it's it's something that's that for many people, was something they they wanted to do. That they it was it was felt as though that was their their spirit, you know, their real home, right? What are downs? <laughs> no, downs are are just sort of undulating um, hills, really. Yeah, I don't know if there's more geographical. Such anybody want to offer in the, in the British countryside? <laughs> Downs. No, it's just a, it's. A, I I think they are. They typically are limestone. They're kind of an undulating. Uh-huh. And interestingly, the, remember the slide I had of Barbados. Um, and of course, there are lots of Caribbean islands where that imposition of the British, um, you know, this sort of this idealized landscape would have been really difficult to impose because you you can't do that in Saint Lucia, right? I mean, that's volcanic. It's it's you know it's black and it's you know it, it the, it's very steep. Um, whereas in Barbados, which is a limestone island, I mean, physically, it's a very different island to um, to the rest of the, the islands. Um, you can impose that landscape much more easily. Likewise, in Ireland, you know, in Ireland, that landscape was imposed upon Ireland. So Susan. you had mentioned that you had emailed um, a person that had done that really cool postcard, but she had never responded. Um, were any of the other, the people that you had featured in the Book, you know, that you're writing about. Mm-hmm. Were, they interested in, <laughs> 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 were any of them interested in, in entering into a dialogue with them or, or with you or did you did you try to the, the ones that were still alive I yeah, think they're yeah, a bit yeah, wary yeah, of yeah, me yeah, yeah. Um, well yes um, certain well um, Derek Walcott I was very lucky because I did my PhD at the University of Essex and he was the poet he was a poet in residence in Essex oh. when I was there so that was particular. that was great that was really good I don't know how interested he was in talking to me but um, he did, I yeah, guess, sorry, and yeah. you know, and that was that was good enough. Um, no, a couple of other people. Um, Andrea Levy. I, I spoke to Andrea Levy very briefly. Grace Nichols. Grace Nichols is she's the nicest person. She's just really, and I've spoken to her, and and yeah, they're interested. But I, I don't. I mean, I don't think they. There must be so many people that write about their work. You know, I don't know how far they're really interested in what you actually have to say, particularly. But, um, but they were very, always very gracious. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can imagine not being delighted that somebody's writing about you. You would think, yeah. right? But Ingrid Pollard, I don't know. I think she, she looks a bit. As I say, she looks a bit fed up, doesn't she? Maybe she just wasn't, didn't, didn't want to. Who knows? She may not have, have got the, uh, have got the memo. But Jean Reese's estate. I mean, Jean Reese is, is, is obviously not. It wasn't her, but I think her granddaughter is is sort of, she's notoriously difficult, and she doesn't allow permission for anything. So, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't do it. I mean, I I asked and I asked and I asked and I asked, and in the end, I was like, you know what, I yeah. I got to get the book out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, other Did questions. You know that a picture of, Piccadilly? of which one? Piccadilly. Piccadilly. It dawned on me. This is sort of a, maybe a punctuation mark. Imagine if instead of Fosters, it was red stripe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there is some, yeah, I mean, you know, McDonald's, Coca-Cola. I don't know when this picture's taken, because I just yeah, ran, grabbed it off the internet. The <laughs> yeah, right, right, it's Japanese stuff. I mean, it's, it's clearly taken a little while ago, because there's a lot more traffic and a lot more people now, so. Yes, John? It seems like all the writers you wrote about um, left the Caribbean, but didn't go back. Um, well, Derek Walcott never really left the Caribbean. He's, I think, um, certainly every everybody else that I wrote about, yeah, left and stayed in in Britain. 
Um, Derek Walcott never really left. Um, he wrote a lot about England. Um, but no, he's one of the few people, actually, he did some, some stints in. He was at Boston University for a while. He was at, the, he was at Essex for a while in Britain. Um, and he certainly lived in other countries, but he, he died. He always had a home in St. Lucia, and he died in St. Lucia. He was always very Caribbean. Yeah, so that was very much where he considered his home to be. Um, but the others, not so much. And B.S. I. Paul wasn't... Um, Reese, I think, would have loved to have gone back, but she lived in a time where she, again, she didn't have the money to do that. Um, and um, and uh, But I think she would have liked to have gone back, but there just weren't the means to do that at the time. Not like today, global travel. <laughs> Anything else? Well, again, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.